Danny the Champion of the World, Chapter 14, Into the Wood. My father came out of the caravan wearing the old navy blue sweater and the brown cloth cap with the peak pulled down low over his eyes. What's under there, Dad? I asked, seeing the bulge at his waistline. He pulled up his sweater and showed me two thin but very large white cotton sacks. They were bound neat and tidy round his belly. To carry the stuff, he said darkly. Aha! Go and put on your sweater, he said. It's brown, isn't it? Yes, I said. That'll do, but take off those white sneakers and wear your black shoes instead. I went into the caravan and changed my shoes and put on my sweater. When I came out again, my father was standing by the pump, squinting anxiously up at the sun, which was now only the width of a man's hand above the line of trees along the crest of the ridge on the far side of the valley. I'm ready, Dad. Good boy. Off we go. Have you got the raisins? I asked. In here, he said, tapping his trouser pocket where yet another bulge was showing. I've put them all in one bag. It was a calm, sunny evening with little wisps of brilliant white cloud hanging motionless in the sky, and the valley was cool and very quiet as the two of us began walking together along the road that ran between the hills towards Wendover. The iron thing underneath my father's foot made a noise like a hammer striking a nail each time it hit the road. This is it, Danny. We're on our way now, he said. By golly, I wish my old dad were coming with us on this one. He'd have given his right teeth to be here at this moment. Mum, too, I said. Ah, yes, he said, giving a little sigh. Your mother would have loved this one. Then he said, Your mother was a great one for walking, Danny, and she would always bring something home with her to brighten up the caravan. In summer, it was wildflowers or grasses. When the grass was in seed, she could make it look absolutely beautiful in a jug of water, especially with some stalks of wheat or barley in between. In the autumn, she would pick branches of leaves, and in the winter, it was berries or old man's beard. We kept going. Then he said, How do you feel, Danny? Terrific, I said, and I meant it. For although the snakes were still wiggling in my stomach, I wouldn't have swapped places with the king of Arabia at that moment. Do you think they might have dug any more of those pits for us to fall into? I asked. Don't you go worrying about pits, Danny, my father said. I'll be on the lookout for them this time. We shall go very carefully and very slowly once we're in the wood. How dark will it be in there when we arrive? Not too dark, he said. Quite light, in fact. Then how do we stop the keepers from seeing us? Ah, he said. That's the fun of the whole thing. That's what it's all about. It's hide and seek. It's the greatest game of hide and seek in the, in the world. You mean because they've got guns? <laughs> well, he said, that does add a bit of flavor to it, yes. We didn't talk much after that. But as we got closer and closer to the wood, I could see my father becoming more and more twitchy as the excitement began to build up in him. He would get hold of some awful old tune, and instead of using the words, he would go, tum tiddly um tum 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 over and over again. Then he would get hold of a, another tune and go, pum piddly um pum 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 piddly um pum piddly um. As he sang, he tried to keep time with the tap-tap of his iron foot on the roadway. When he got tired of that, he said to me, I'll tell you something interesting about pheasants, Danny. The law says they're wild birds, so they only belong to you when they're on your own land. Did you know that? I didn't know that, Dad. So if one of Mr. Hazel's pheasants flew over and perched on our filling station, he said, it would belong to us. No one else would be allowed to touch it. You mean even if Mr. Hazel had bought it himself as a chick? I said. Even if he had bought it and reared it in his own wood? Absolutely, my father said. Once it flies off his own land, he's lost it. Unless, of course, it flies back again. It's the same with fish. 
Once a trout or salmon has swum out of your stretch of the river into somebody else's, you can't very well say, hey, that's mine, I want it back, can you? Of course not, I said, but I didn't know it was like that with pheasants. It's the same with all game, my father said, hare, deer, partridge, grouse, you name it. We had been walking steadily for about an hour and a quarter, and we were coming to the gap in the hedge where the cart track led up the hill to the big wood where the pheasants lived. We crossed over the road and went through the gap. We walked on up the cart track, and when we reached the crest of the hill, we could see the wood ahead of us, huge and dark, with the sun going down behind the trees and little sparks of gold shining through. No talking, Danny, once we're inside, my father said. Keep very close to me and try not to go snapping any branches. Five minutes later, we were there. The wood skirted the edge of the track on the right-hand side with only the hedge between it and us. Come on, my father said. In we go. He slipped through the hedge on all fours and I followed. It was cool and murky inside the wood. No sunlight came in at all. My father took me by the hand, and together we started walking forward between the trees. I was very grateful to him for holding my hand. I had wanted to take hold of his the moment we entered the wood, but I thought he might disapprove. My father was very tense. He was picking his feet up high and putting them down gently on the brown leaves. He kept his head moving all the time, the eyes sweeping slowly from side to side, searching for danger. I tried doing the same, but soon I began to see a keeper behind every tree, so I gave it up. We went on like this for maybe four or five minutes, going slowly deeper and deeper into the wood. Then a large patch of sky appeared ahead of us in the roof of the forest, and I knew that this must be the clearing. My father had told me that the clearing was the place where the young birds were introduced into the wood in early July, where they were fed and watered and guarded by the keepers, and where many of them stayed from force of habit until the shooting began. There's always plenty of pheasants in the clearing, my father had said. And keepers, Dad? Yes, he had said, but there's thick bushes all around, and that helps. The clearing was about a hundred yards ahead of us. We stopped behind a big tree while my father let his eyes travel very slowly all around. He was checking each little shadow and every part of the wood within sight. We're going to have to crawl the next bit, he whispered, letting go of my hand. Keep close behind me all the time, Danny, and do exactly as I do. If you see me lie flat on my face, You do the same, right? Right, I whispered back. Off we go then. This is it. My father got down on his hands and knees and started crawling. I followed. He moved surprisingly fast on all fours, and I had quite a job to keep up with him. Every few seconds he would glance back at me to see if I was all right, and each time he did so, I gave him a nod and a smile. We crawled on and on, and then at last we were kneeling safely behind a big clump of bushes, right on the edge of the clearing. My father was nudging me with his elbow and pointing through the branches at the pheasants. The place was absolutely stiff with them. There must have been at least 200 huge birds strutting around among the tree stumps. You see what I mean? He whispered. It was a fantastic sight, a poacher's dream come true, and how close they were. Some of them were not ten paces from where we knelt. The hens were plump and creamy brown. They were so fat, their breast feathers almost brushed the ground as they walked. The males were slim and elegant, with long tails and brilliant red patches round the eyes, like scarlet spectacles. I glanced at my father. His face was transfixed in ecstasy. The mouth was slightly open, and the eyes were sparkling bright as they stared at the pheasants. There's a keeper, he said softly. 
I froze. At first, I didn't even dare to look. Over there, my father whispered. I mustn't move, I told myself, not even my head. Look carefully, my father whispered. Over the other side, by that big tree. Slowly, I swiveled my eyes in the eyeballs in the direction he indicated. Then I saw him. Dad, I whispered. Don't move now, Danny. Stay well down. Yes, but Dad, it's all right. He can't see us. We crouched close to the ground, watching the keeper. He was a smallish man with a cap on his head and a big double-barreled shotgun under his arm. He never moved. He was like a little post standing there. Should we go? I whispered. The keeper's face was shadowed by the peak of his cap, but it seemed to me he was looking straight at us. Should we go, Dad? Hush, my father said. Slowly, never taking his eyes from the keeper, he reached into his pocket and brought out a single raisin. He placed it in the palm of his right hand and then quickly, with a little flick of the wrist, he threw the raisin high into the air. I watched it as it went sailing over the bushes and I saw it land within a yard of two hen birds standing beside an old tree stump. Both birds turned their heads sharply at the drop of the raisin. Then one of them hopped over and made a quick peck at the ground, and that must have been it. I looked at the keeper. He hadn't moved. I could feel a trickle of cold sweat running down one side of my forehead and across my cheek. I didn't dare lift a hand to wipe it away. My father threw a second raisin into the clearing, then a third, and a fourth, and a fifth. It takes guts to do that, I thought. Terrific guts. If I'd have been alone, I would never have stayed there for one second. But my father was in a sort of poacher's trance. For him, this was it. This was the moment of danger, the biggest thrill of all. He kept on throwing the raisins into the clearing, swiftly, silently, one at a time. Flick went his wrist, and up went the raisin high over the bushes to land among the pheasants. Then all at once, I saw the keeper turn away his head to inspect the wood behind him. My father saw it too. Quick as a flash, he pulled the bag bag of raisins out of his pocket and tipped the whole lot into the palm of his right hand. Dad, I whispered, don't. But with a great sweep of the arm, he flung the entire handful way over the bushes into the clearing. They fell with a soft little patter like raindrops on dry leaves, and every single pheasant in the place must have heard them fall. There was a flurry of wings and a rush to find the treasure. The keeper's head flicked round as though there were a spring inside his neck. The birds were all pecking away madly at the raisins. The keeper took two quick paces forward, and for a moment I thought he was going in to investigate. But then he stopped, and his face came up, and his eyes began traveling slowly round the edge of the clearing. Lie down flat, my father whispered. Stay there. Don't move an inch. I flattened my body against the ground and pressed one side of my face into the brown leaves. The soil below the leaves had a strange, pungent smell like beer. Out of one eye, I saw my father raise his head just a tiny bit to watch the keeper. He kept watching him. Don't you love this? He whispered to me. I didn't dare answer him. 
We lay there for what seemed like a hundred years. At last I heard my father whisper, Panic's over. Follow me, Danny, but be extra careful. He's still there. And keep down low all the time. He started crawling away quickly on his hands and knees. I went after him. I kept thinking of the keeper who was somewhere behind us. I was very conscious of that keeper, and I was also very conscious of my own backside and how it was sticking up in the air for all to see. I could understand now why poacher's bottom was a fairly common complaint in this business. We went along on our hands and knees for about a hundred yards. Now run, my father said. We got to our feet and ran, and a few minutes later we came out through the hedge into the lovely open safety of the cart track. It went marvelously, my father said, breathing heavily. Didn't it go absolutely marvelously? His face was scarlet and glowing with triumph. Did the keeper see us? I asked. Not on your life, he said. And in a few minutes, the sun will be going down and the birds will all be flying up to roost and that keeper will be sloping off home to his supper. Then all we've got to do is go back in again and help ourselves. We'll be picking them up off the ground like pebbles. He sat down on the grassy bank below the hedge. I sat down close to him. He put an arm round my shoulders and gave me a hug. You did well, Danny, he said. I'm right proud of you. So ends chapter 14, Danny the Champion of the World.